Thanks for tuning in to In Progress, a new series dedicated to discussing the critical ongoing issues of our time and how our new school community is addressing them. I'm Bianca Sakley, a proud alum of the International Affairs Graduate Program at the New School. In today's episode, we'll be talking about something so near and dear to my heart, social movements and democracy. Our guest is the esteemed scholar, Diva Woodley. Diva is an associate professor of politics and the director of undergraduate studies for politics here at the university. Her work focuses on social movements and their impact on democracies. She is the author of The Politics of Common Sense, How Social Movements Use Public Discourse to Change Politics and Win Acceptance. And she has a new forthcoming book, Reckoning, Black Lives Matter and the Democratic Necessity of Social Movements. Here at the New School, she has launched a new initiative for the study of power, politics, and organizing in the U.S. I know that in just researching for this episode alone, I have clung to every word of Divas as they have offered just so much refreshing clarity and hope, which is why I'm so excited to debut this entire series with her. Diva, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you be a part of this series. So I really just wanted to start this conversation with unpacking the term you have coined, politics of care which is something that asks us to completely reimagine the way we think about politics and governance and society as a whole. So could you just start off with giving us an overview of what a politics of care is? Well, the politics of care is, um, you know, actually something that I observed when I was doing my research on the movement for Black Lives and how it operates. And what I came to understand as I was doing research on the social movement is that this social movement is actually underpinned by an entire political philosophy um, that really asks us to change our orientation towards what politics is and what it consists of. And one of the major aspects of that is a politics of care. And what the politics of care acknowledges, um, and it has roots, uh, obviously, in other kinds of political philosophies, right? So feminist philosophies, Black feminism being chief among them, um, also certain kinds of socialisms or, um, you know, anarchisms, um, what it takes as its um, main uh, position is that people deserve care and that care is required for all life. And so um, in politics, which is the major way that we um, distribute responsibilities, um, you know, make the laws that will govern our communities and our polities um, and make decisions about how we will go, we will go forward together, um, that politics should be oriented around this central fact everyone and everything will require care. Um, And one of our responsibilities, our main responsibility in conducting our politics must be to justly distribute um, responsibilities for that care and also to take as given that everyone deserves care, not because of what they do, not because of how they look, not because of the kinds of Um, rights that are prescribed to them by the polities that they belong to or may migrate to, but just because they are people, they deserve care. And so it's a whole kind of reorientation around how we think through what politics consists in and what its purpose is. Yeah, it's such a basic principle. People deserve care, but (laughs) one that hasn't existed, but it's so important to center that. Um, I really wanted to expand on something that you just mentioned in your work. You talk about radical black feminist pragmatism. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and why politics of care is a pillar of that? Sure. Um, Radical black feminist pragmatism is just the name of the political philosophy that I found to be operative in the movement for black lives. Just to back up, I am a scholar of social movements and I have studied um, many contemporary social movements in the U.S. Um, And so as the movement for black lives emerged, it made total sense for me to also um, study this emergent movement that was clear from the very beginning was going to be very influential. And as I began to study it, um, I understood that this was Uh, a movement that was about more than, although it is also about these things, but it's about more than policies. It's about more than, um, you know, um, uh, getting accountability and um, in, um, you know, in cases of uh, um, abuse by institutions, particularly 
uh, but not exclusively institutions of policing. Um, and it's about more than getting recognition for um, people who have been mistreated or um, black folks who are systematically mistreated uh, along with other people of color um, and um, uh, people who are minoritized in various kinds of ways. It's about more than that. It's also about rethinking um, how we do politics, right? Um, and the um, political philosophy um, that I think, or the names, right, that I think best encapsulate this political philosophy are radical, black feminist, and pragmatism. And the reason I chose these terms is um, because the radical part of the political philosophy is not really to do with any particular positions. It's instead an approach. It is a way that um, folks in movement approach political questions. They understand the given, right? So you have a lot of very skilled people who are um, know the laws, right? Know the sort of policy environment, um, know the political environment, right? Um, those kinds of subtleties. Um, but they don't start there. Instead, they start with what are the things that have to be um, changed, unmade, rebuilt, or built for the first time that um, we would have to do in order to make sure that the most marginalized people are able to live and thrive, right? Um, and that's radical because that means that they can start questions like, um, what do we do about police violence? Not at the question of which reforms are necessary, but instead at the position of abolition, which just says, actually this whole institution is not working. And so we need to think about the radix, right? That's where radic radical comes from, the root of this problem. And the root of this problem is that, um, you know, we need to reconceptualize what we think of as safety. And we need to think a lot more about the conditions um, that ensure safety and to understand based on a voluminous amount of empirical evidence that policing is actually not one of these um, you know, elements, right? Um, Anti-poverty measures are one of these elements. Mental health care and health care in general are one of these elements. So a radical approach is to say, well, let's focus on those things, right? And not put our focus and our resources um, on trying to reform a thing that we know is broken, okay? The black feminism is the political philosophy part of it, right? And is has deep roots in American political thought. Um, and Black feminism is a way of looking at politics that focuses on building out our theorization, right, of our ethics, uh, but also our policy positions and preferences from the lived experience of the most vulnerable, right? That is the sort of like basis of Black feminist politics. Um, and then you combine that to say that um, we also, as we're looking at these lived experiences, need to look at the structural relationships, right, that intersect, right, via how we're identified um, and our material resources to create the conditions that prevent us from thriving. Right, and that has been called variously interlocking oppressions, intersectionality, um, you know, uh, uh, and a variety of, of, of sort of other things. But these two basic notions, right? Lived experience is the place that, that you must start theorizing and acting from, and that we have to look at structural con conditions as they intersect and impact people's actual lives. These are major tenets of Black feminism, and they are taken up in the movement for Black lives. And then the pragmatism is the part that often um, um, shocks people, um, uh, both people in the world and scholars, right? Um, but when I say pragmatism, I'm talking about not political pragmatism of triangulation. So the like 1990s Democratic Party pragmatism is not what I mean. I mean, philosophical pragmatism um, from folks uh, like uh, John Dewey in particular, um, but also Cornell West, um, you know, and then historical, more historical figures like William James. Um, and pragmatism is a political philosophy that says, um, very in a complementary way, I think, with Black feminism, is to say that whatever we create, right, in terms of the way that we do politics, is not going to be perfect and right for all time. <laughs> it's just not, right? What pragmatism says is, and we may not get it right, but what we have to understand is that politics is about iterations. We want to get things as close to right as we can, but if we don't get it right, we have to evaluate what we have done, 
reassess and come back to the table. Because what pragmatism gives us is an optimism that's born of practicality <laughs> and awareness of history. Um, and it is uh, also grounded in a very deep democratic belief that people, given the time and space and conditions to work and talk and think together, will come up with the best solutions for themselves, right, at that moment in time. With the caveat that whatever we come up with in this time will not be relevant 100 years from now. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> so much to, yeah, take in there. I I love what you said. You know, it is iterative, iterative and uh, it's liberating in a way to have this, you know, room to reflect and to grow because what we do now won't work in the future and just giving us that space to continue to evolve and I love what you have said about it. It has a practical end. It has practical mm -hmm. means. Care is practical. Um, that's just wonderful. So I would like to talk about the politics of despair. So flipping things a little bit, um, which really, you know, as we said, provides important context to everything that's going on right now. Um, you've broken down the politics of despair into six trends. Rising inequality, declining political trust, declining interpersonal trust, declining civic knowledge, declining and stratified political participation, and lastly, declining political efficacy. And if I may, I'd just like to share a couple of stats um, that support these trends that you shared in some of your essays. So for income inequality, America's upper income families possess seven times the wealth of middle income families and 70 times the wealth of lower income families, which is the largest gap ever recorded by the Federal Reserve. For trust in government in 1958, 73% of Americans trusted the government to do the right thing just about always or most of the time. 2001, that number went to 49%. And today, only 19% of respondents feel this way. Interpersonal trust levels really speak to how polarized we've become. So 86% of Democrats have an unfavorable view of Republicans, and that number is 91% for Republicans on Democrats. Um, and lastly, in regards to civic education, and this one really kind of discourages me, is only one quarter of Americans are able to name the three branches of government and one third of Americans uh, unable to name any of them. And I would argue that's really little to no fault of their own. We've really got to work on our civic education curriculum. So when you add all of this up, it's really no surprise that Americans are feeling disillusioned and thus political participation has declined. So what do you make of all of this, the politics of despair? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the politics of despair is very real and it has an empirical basis. I should say the politics of despair is um, the uh, assessment by people in the polity that um, no matter what they do, things are not going to be able to, what they do collectively, right, politically, they're not going to be able to change things. They're not going to be able to change things to make their lives better. And so people turn their focus inward right, um, to their own actions, to their own families, to their own communities, um, um, while disavowing, right, um, the efficacy of um, the things that we would do together. But of course, so much of what inhibits our life chances is structural, right? There are institutions that are bigger than us that we didn't design, that we have to participate in, right, by default. Um, that that kind of turning inward, while understandable, is also self-defeating. Right. Um, because no matter how good a relationship, for example, you have with your partner, um, you know, if you have care responsibilities for either an elderly parent or for children, um, you are going to be subject to the institutional lack of support for care work. Right. Um, that exists in this country. And the only way to change that is to change institutions that requires political participation. So it's a kind it's so it's a. Um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, but it's also based on real empirical, uh, 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 you know, real world conditions. What I say about the politics of despair and what I believe to be true is that um, the answer, right, um, to the politics of despair, the way that people begin to understand themselves as people who can act and affect the world um, collectively, right, both individually and collectively, 
is social movements. And so this moment in which so many social movements are underway, right, are proliferating, is a moment for people to get engaged and people have been getting engaged. Now, where it will lead, um, you know, is an open question. Um, But as a Democrat, right, as a small D Democrat, as a philosophical Democrat that really believes that we do better when people reason and um, think and feel and plan together how they will govern uh, their communities uh, and their polities, I think it's a moment of real potential. Um, The danger, the only danger, is that people disengage, right? If people begin to disengage, if people begin to turn their eyes away from um, the ways that we can work together to govern ourselves, uh, then we'll be in a serious problem. Uh, Because... um, You know, there are many constituencies in, uh, powerful constituencies in the United States, and one entire political party, right, that is basically anti-democratic, that wants to exclude people from the process of uh, participation, um, that wants to um, discourage and criminalize protest, um, that um, is really not interested uh, in any way uh, in improving the structural conditions of people's lives, um, even those that they claim to represent. Um, And then there's a whole other, um, you know, um, set, you know, somewhat overlapping constituency, but another constituency that has really embraced um, a kind of, um, you know, um, terroristic politics, right? Um, That is about um, sort of uh, uh, white grievance, um, ethno-nationalism, Um, uh, that really wants to say that the only people who count in the American policy are the people that we deem real and deserving. Um, And those people are are white and um, many of them are um, uh, rich uh, or they have to live in the areas that we deem to be the real genuine sort of areas of America. So there are these forces that are um, sort of battling against each other and they're not necessarily new, but we're at a moment of heightened tension and we're at a moment when the stakes are very high um, because we really are deciding the trajectory of the 21st century right now. That is what is happening. Um, And it can be a very dark era, right? It it certainly can be. but it could also be an era of incredible progress and hope. So last question, the spirit of the show is to discuss and think critically about issues, movements and crises that are in progress. So this moment that we're living in with social moment, social movements and protests, seeing some of the highest levels of participation in human history, as we talked about, does it give you hope for a more just democracy? You know, do you think we are witnessing a lasting shift in civic engagement where people better understand and utilize their collective power? I hope so. I mean, um, you know, this is a moment that that in the social sciences we call a critical juncture. So it means that a lot more is possible in this moment than is normally possible just um, because of a kind of um, inertia, right? Um, so that does give me hope. The sophistication and collaboration and determination and professionalization uh, or training of movement organizations and their proliferation, that gives me hope. Um, the engagement or the re-engagement uh, of people in their local politics and in um, uh, activities of mutual aid, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, the possible shift in our philosophy of governance, that gives me a lot of hope, right? That gives me a lot of hope. It makes a lot of other things possible down the line. Because here's the thing, is that so many folks, um, you know, today, the day that we're recording this is the, um, um, the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And so many people are doing reflections and assessments today about what has changed in the last year. And the thing that bothers me about these reflections is that people behave as though changes that will take a generation at least might have taken place, right, if everything had gone right, in one year, right? Um, and, And that's just not the way to look at things, right? The work that we do now 
the things that we make possible with our work now really won't come to fruition, not full fruition, right? For at least a generation, right? We have to think about this really as century long work, right? What we think of as the prosperity, for example, of the 20th century wasn't solidified until the middle of it, right? Um, and so the, what we're doing right now is laying the groundwork for changes that will come to fruition for our children, right? And our children's children, if we do it right. Um, so yes, I have a lot of hope, but I also have the perspective that this is long work. Um, and I also have in um, the knowledge, right? Um, that things could go very wrong right at the same time these moments of opportunity are also moments of danger so it really is up to us when i'm a grandmother in 2070 right or whatever um and i am telling stories of the plague years right and of the sort of social movements right um that i can be looking out on a world that is really very different where it is not controversial to say right um that people um you know, deserve to have care because they exist in the world, um, that everyone has access to housing, to food, to education, as a matter of course, because that's what it means to be a civilized society, right? Um, you know, that's my hope, and I do believe that it is achievable, but we do have to choose it. We have to choose it collectively, and we have to successfully combat, right? It's not all kumbaya. We have to successfully combat, right, um, uh, communities, folks, forces that are also organized to prevent, right, uh, this progress and to um, make sure that prosperity remains um, exclusive and actually gets more and more exclusive um, um, while suffering is more and more generalized. I'm always thinking about my future grandbabies and what I'll <laughs> tell them that I did in this moment, but Thank you so much for this phenomenal conversation. I'm feeling even more hopeful and grounded. Um, I've been deliberating about whether or not to get a PhD, and now I just want to like study all your work even more. <laughs> so thank you just for being such a wonderful guest for our new show. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. Um, and I just, um, I do hope that people do feel hopeful. Um, and um, even as we acknowledge our barriers, right, the barriers to our success, um, I think that the, one of the old protest chants is correct, right? The people united will never be defeated. So um, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Our rallying call, yes. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you. Social movements are this this microcosm of what we are at our core, which is good, and we, we like to keep each other safe and take care of each other. My name is Polly Kamakam. I'm a digital organizer and a media activist based in Brooklyn, New York. I've been working in the social justice space using video and storytelling and technology as advocacy tools for about a decade now. I started with journalism. I wanted to go all around the world and tell stories and report on international issues. When I went to grad school at the New School, I shifted my focus towards more of this like video advocacy, media advocacy angle. I first started kind of doing this work through my field program in South Africa where we actually went there with a couple other students and we trained youth activists from a grassroots organization on how to use video and like short documentary and testimony as part of their grassroots organizing work for equity in the South African education system. Some of the video that we filmed with the youth organizers ended up being used as part of a human rights court case that the organization ended up winning. I saw the potential that video could have not just to tell a story about something, but for something very specific. So then when I came back to the United States, I started a nonprofit called The Babel Project, and we would basically hire teaching artists. And the idea was to train youth activists who are already using all these tools and just give them video and video advocacy as one more tool for their tool belt. That kind of more video advocacy work led me towards a full-time job at Witness. And at Witness, I also trained communities on how to use often just their cell phones to document human rights abuses.
we're coming up on you know the one year anniversary of the largest uprising in our country's history and video played a really crucial part in that not only in exposing police violence and you know abuse against protesters but i think it was also you know it was a really visceral important tool to engage people and get people to the streets i mean the fact that people took to the streets in the middle of a global pandemic just shows you even more the kind of power and urgency of protest. A role that I tried to play during the protest was to make myself readily available as a resource for folks because I knew that documentation was going to be such a crucial way to expose violence and tell the true narrative of what was happening at these protests. And so that was a really big part of, of last summer was um, being able to support my community through these types of like on the ground guerrilla style trainings. So most recently I took on a role as the senior campaign manager for the criminal justice and democracy team at Color of Change. My work is a little different from what I did before because it's not as focused on video, but it's still, you know, using digital uh, tactics, technology, video storytelling as different campaign tools. Now I'm actually part of the strategy to build those campaigns. So I just wanted to give an example of two of the campaigns that I'm working on and some of the like digital tactics that I'm using for it. In just 2021 alone, there's been 81 new anti-protest laws that have been proposed and passed around the country. And so we were like, we need to do something about this. So we're focusing on how we can protect protesters and do defense work. We're trying to figure out a national strategy, a national advocacy strategy, how to involve the DOJ, how to do base building, how to train communities. Just as someone who, you know, took to the streets, who really believes in the power of protest, being able to now be a part of um, fighting anti-protest legislation, I think is really important. I'm a big fan of meeting people where they're at, creating resources for folks to meet different education levels, experience levels, languages, um, types of learners is really important to me. And I think what I've learned over the last decade is how to be passionate and pragmatic. And sometimes that means taking a step back and figuring out how can I take this really wonky policy issue and be able to communicate it to someone who has no idea what the issue is. There's a lot of power in that. I get asked a lot, how can I get involved? I want to do more. You don't have to be on the front lines to make an impact. Everyone has a role to play. Like if we're going to transform society, everyone's got it. We've got to transform every single facet of it to build people power so that we're the ones holding our electeds accountable. That like joy that is created from social movements is the most powerful thing in the world. To me, being an active citizen means staying informed with what's currently happening in the world. So not just, I guess, where you're living or like just the United States, but like everywhere, um, even though you're not a citizen of those places, but because you're, I guess, a citizen of the world. Helping people out and like sort of acknowledging like certain struggles and like what people go through and respecting them and helping people through things, even if it doesn't benefit you. Taking a role in your community that is not just passive, that is not just reposting infographics, but that is actually tangible. For example, mutual aid. It's taking care of your community and being aware of everyone that's around you and making actions that comply with that. Looking at the world and seeing, I guess, what needs to be changed or what you would want to change and then I guess just going about and trying every day, I, I guess it doesn't have to be in huge ways, but I would say every day in little ways, try and make your world or like the world around you a bit better for you and other people. We're all parts of lots of communities, um, creative communities, class student communities, um, and then the larger community that makes up the city. So I think to be a sort of active member of those communities can mean both just having positive interactions with people on the day to day, um, but can also mean using the skills we're learning in school, whether those be uh, creative skills um, or anything else to sort of help both in our classes and in 
the community at large. Active citizenship to me is when we as individuals choose to go against the norm and we are going to fight for what we believe in, whether that be Black Lives Matter or with sustainability or even with just like our economy and our society. It is something that we are willing to fight for in order to make a change because we see something that is not for us. Active citizenship means that you care about the well-being of the community. 